So let's get started with reviewing SP, SP2, and SP3 hybridization side by side. Very important valence bond theory that helps us explain what we know experimentally for the central atom. For instance, we start with BEF2. If we do a Lewis dot diagram, and we see that BEF2 is actually 1s2, 2s2, right? And that's how we want to do that. We have an issue here because, well, it doesn't have any what? It doesn't have any partially filled orbitals. And what's weird about beryllium is, well, you think it's a metal, and it, but it undergoes some covalent bonding. It's a weird guy to look at, but as I've done before, beryllium has two valence electrons, and we like to split them up. And then we have fluorine, who has seven valence electrons because it's 1s2, 2s2. 2p5 so there's seven valence electrons and so we fill the rest with seven it's a nice pairing these are both non-metals with pretty high well this is a non-metal that pulls electrons over here this is going to be some sharing here and this is the Lewis dot structure now notice how I drew the fluorines on opposite sides because I know something about VSCPR theory valence shell electron uh, pair repulsion theory. There's pairs of electrons that are animating from the center of the beryllium. And these pairs of electrons are going to repel themselves into what we call a linear shape. And so we know this to be linear from X-ray crystallography. We have that experimental evidence. We know from that type of empirical as evidence it's 180 degrees. The question is, what does it look like? How does it do that? Like I just said before, it's 1s2, 2s2. So how can it make two bonds if all of its orbitals electrons are filled? Well, we have a theory, and the theories are, are, are there to try to explain things and be able to predict. And it, this theory does, and it's, of course, a van, it's hybridization. And it's a type of valence uh, a bond theory. So with energy, this electron jumps over here. And so it kind of makes sense that we would have now two open orbitals. This could be the 2s2 orbital here, and this could be a 2p orbital over here with one electron, and the fluorine gives off the other electron, and it fills it, and it makes a stable uh, compound by filling orbitals. Okay, and so that makes some sense there, but the weird thing is, when we look at the empirical evidence, we know that the energy it takes to break this bond is the same it takes to break this bond. If beryllium is using a 2s2 uh, orbital and a 2p uh, orbital, 2p's are not as stable as 2s, we would expect this bond from a 2p to be less energy, but they're exactly the same. And what's even more interesting, the energy to break these bonds are the same, and they're in between the energy level of this s and p. So someone thought that maybe an s with one electron, okay, let me get rid of the, um, the fluorine's electrons, the s with with a P mixed together. And what it made, okay, is two new orbitals. Two orbitals come in, two orbitals come out. But what's important to understand that this orbital is an sp orbital. By itself, it holds two electrons. Now, it only has one, the one from the beryllium. And there's another orbital that comes out called the sp. There's two sp's. Why two? Because we start with this orbital and this orbital, and we get two equal orbitals that have energies or quantum levels that are somewhere in between what we see from, of course, the bond energies. And of course, this has one electron here. And you can see clearly that two regions of electrons repel themselves into a linear shape. So it makes sense that two um, orbitals of even energy would repel themselves outward. Now, this hybridization theory, because we're saying there's sp hybridization for the central atom, is not necessary for the for the terminal atoms, the atoms at the end. The fluorine just has one p orbital unfilled. So I'm going to push one unhybridized p orbital over here, and I'm going to draw all the unhybridized p orbitals. Remember, this is one orbital here. Here's another one, and so this could be two p, let's say y, x, and this would be two p z coming at you. 
Now I'm going to draw the S. Now we know the S is about the same distance as P. Remember the N number quantizes size. I'm making it much smaller so we can just uh, see the overlapping of just the P orbital. Now if we do the valence electrons, we say that there's two in the S. So I'm just going to put two in here. I know that this two could be anywhere here, but I'm just going to throw them here. And I know that they're really waves, but this is a valence bond theory using dots. Okay. And so then I put the, the five other electrons. One, two, three, four, and then the fifth one is here, and there's my bond right there. We call it an overlapping or sigma bond, okay? And so basically a px, one of the p orbitals, the one that had one in him, overlapped directly the sp orbital and created a bond. This one feels like it has two, and so does this one, and that's how covalent bonding works. And of course, we have the same thing on the other side, and I'll draw it for fun. Here's one of the two p's, and here's another p orbital and the one coming at you the z and i'll throw in the s for good measure and we can put in those valence one two for the s three four five six and the seven makes the bond and there's another sigma bond okay and so i don't need uh, hybridization for the terminal atoms because I just need to explain the central atom, which, by the way, has a 180 degree bond angle based upon two regions of electrons repelling themselves that have the same quantum or energy level. Okay, and so this nicely explains why this is linear, and we can predict that with our understanding of hybridization. And then, of course, the molecular geometry. You know, would be of course linear as well and it's something i need to speak speak about if you the electron domain geometry is the geometry of the electrons around the central atom sometimes we're going to see some lone pairs so we have to consider just how many of these orbitals since we only have two orbitals sp and s and p comes together and makes two orbitals they're going to repel themselves always in a 180 shape and because we don't have any lone pairs on one side we're always going to see linear for the molecular geometry. The molecular geometry is where the atoms bond. And there's going to be times where we have no atoms in a lone pair position where the molecular geometry will be different. But one thing to make clear, if it's sp hybridized, the bond angle must be 180. The electron domain geometry is always one, is linear. Okay. Now, in terms of polarity, this is a nonpolar molecule. And the reason is very clear. Now that I know the geometry, very symmetrical, even though fluorine is a more electronegative and pulls most electron density toward the outside of this molecule, both sides are the same. So this has most electron density on this side. This has a lot of electron, the same electron density as this has. So because these both sides of the molecule are the same, okay, there's no difference between them. We say it's symmetrical. There is no real difference. If I draw it something like this and we say, okay, this end has a good amount of electrons and this one has the same amount, this uh, is no different from this side. There's no two differences. There's no poles. And therefore, because of the symmetrical nature of this molecule, having two Fs on the outside in a 180-degree bond angle, there is going to be a symmetrical distribution of charge and therefore nonpolar. As I love to say, even though there is asymmetry on this, there's there's what an uneven amount of electrons on this side compared to the middle, the unequalness on both sides is equal, right? The unequalness over here compared to the middle is the same as this unequalness of this middle. So therefore, there's no difference between the two ends. Therefore, no poles, a nonpolar molecule. Okay, very important. All right, let's move on because this is too much fun. All right, and again, what's really important about this theory is that we can use the hybridization theory to explain, okay, a, a lot of properties just putting dots on a piece of paper. So BH3, let's start with some dots. We have boron, and boron is 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. Actually, there's it exists like this. Okay, so it's this one isn't here. And if you can see, when we do the dots, I'm going to say, well, there's three valence electrons. There's two in the S and one in the P. And I'm going to separate these dots by a third. And I do that because I know that what? Electrons are going to repel themselves. H's bring one to the table, right? So I'll put the H's here. And I'll just change the color because I can. And each H brings a dot, a dot, and a dot. And I'll go, again, this is a different kind of one because it has six but it fills all its orbitals, maybe. Hydrogen feels stable because it fills its first energy level, 1s2. Now, how can I explain this? Okay, well, 
given some energy, this electron was kicked out to the 2p. And so we're left with um, the drawing that I have here. And now what do I have? I have one, two, three orbitals that have one apiece. And more importantly, we know experimentally the bond energies of these three, guess what, are all the same, but some are in between. So an S and two Ps, okay, mixed together. Three orbitals in, three orbitals out. And these three equal orbitals with one apiece look something like this. And they repel themselves, and you can guess, but that's a terribly drawn one, you can guess that they repel themselves into a triangle. These three pairs of electrons are going to push off each other and so that the bond angle is 120. And you can bet the 120 degree bond angle for sp2 hybridization for the central atom, we don't need it for the terminal one, is upheld by okay, crystal x-ray crystallography. Now, so the borons in the middle, these are all sp2s. That means an s and two p's come together to make three new orbitals that are going to repel themselves into this triangle. They all have one valence electron. And then the H comes by. And H is 1s1, so it's just circular. Don't need any hybridization there. It's a 1s1 and brings another electron. And there is my sigma bonds. And I have three of them. And notice this is very much a triangle in the same plane. Right? It's flat. So we call this triangle planar. And it's the electron domain geometry always for sp2. So to make it fancy, we, we, we jazz it up and say trigonal. Okay, planar. It's a triangle in the same plane. Okay. The molecular geometry, well, it's the same. The reason is the atoms in all three positions. However, if there was a lone pair, and we're going to see examples of this at some point. If there's a lone pair here, we don't consider the lone pair as part of the molecule. The molecule is where the atoms are. Remember, this is boron in the middle. This is H. So if there was a lone pair, this would be a bent shape. So you can see there's a time where the molecular geometry will be different if you've got a lone pair, when you consider where the atoms are. But if, in this case, since we have the atoms in all of the three positions, trigonal planar, which is always going to be the electron domain geometry of the electrons, okay, right, of the electrons repelling themselves into that shape, well, will also be the molecular geometry. But trigonal planar is always for how electrons repel themselves in sp2. Now, if you can see, because we understand the geometry, this is also very symmetrical charge distribution so this is a non-polar molecule okay now one thing i do want to step back and say people say well why can't i use an unhybridized p in the middle here and it's important you get this if i'm going to bond to an unhybridized p like i am here this px is now what filled if i bond here this end of the px for this molecule is filled you can't bond here so in order to have a 180 degree bond angle for SP, I forgot to mention this, that's why I'm backtracking. Okay, you have to have the central atom be hybridized because P orbitals can't do 180. Once you bond to one P orbital, it's filled because this is the entire orbital. Okay, really important. Okay, now CH4. Let's put some dots to the paper. Carbon is 1S2, 2S2, 2P2. So it has four valence electrons. And I'm going to separate these four valence electrons because you bet they're going to what? Repel themselves. And my gosh, how do I explain this? Well, with some energy, probably this electron, against a theory, jumps out to the third. And when we do that, we can see, maybe, that um, all of these guys, okay, now have a single in each a single electron in all and in, in the outermost four orbitals. Even though they're different energy, to explain this, we hybridize. But in any case, put the H's in. Don't want to H around here, so we put some H's. Each one brings an electron. And there we go. And that's our that's our Lewis dot diagram. In this case, by sharing four electrons from each from one hydrogen, we fill the entire orbitals that are available and that's something we were doing for what all of them there's a stability when you fill all available orbitals 
That's why filling the d orbitals is a stability issue too. Okay, so in this case, it not only fills its orbitals, it has the same configuration as a noble gas, so a very stable compound. And of course, you can see that it fulfills something called the octet rule, filling the S and the P. Carbon feels like eight by sharing one from the, each of the four. But let's draw this. How in the world did it get four equal shapes repelling each other? And of course, when we break the bonds, like I said before, the energy level is something in between an S and the P, so it must have been an S and three Ps. Hey, that's why we have a three there. Hybridizing. And they're going to have four, pair, four different orbitals. Each one's an sp3. And this is an sp3. And they're going to repel in all four directions. Now, it's, it's hard to see this structure. I talk about this in class. But we'll draw it like planar first. It's not planar. Okay, if you think of the planar molecule looking down at it and I put an orbital on top, it's going to push all these guys down. And that's what we call tetrahedral, tetra for four, so tetrahedral. Okay, tetra, well, that's spelled tetrahedral. Okay, and that's always the electron domain geometry. Put in the four valence electrons. I know I used blue before, so. And then, of course, bring in the H's which are, of course, 1s1, so they're spherical. L equals what? Zero. All right, so there you go, and there's the shape. I should, and, of course, I have what? Four overlapping bonds. And the bond angle is something you really can't calculate. It's going to be lower than 120 because you're adding another lobe of electrons. It's 109.5, a very famous bond angle for sp3 type hybrids. Okay, and how do I know it's sp3? How do I go from the dots to know it's hybridized sp3? Party people, once you do your Lewis dot diagram, count the regions of electrons. I count one, two, three, four. If I have four regions of electrons, my friends, I must have four equal orbitals. And they're going to repel themselves by VSEPR theory into the tetrahedral shape. Now, there are two other shapes besides tetrahedral. And like this case, it's tetrahedral because all of the atoms, the molecular geometry, is where the atoms are. So we have tetrahedral. Now, if we have one lone pair, okay, and let me try to explain this by writing something two-dimensionally that shows three dimensions. Here's carbon. Here's one H. Here's another H. They're on the same plane. I have one H coming at you. That's what this dark thing is. And then one H coming behind you if that makes any sense. If you can visualize that this is the top of a three-sided pyramid, this is coming up. Or think about this as um, three legs of a tripod and, and the camera sticking up in the middle. That's what, a, that's what a tetrahedral is. So if I have a lone pair, okay, let's make this the lone pair, okay? Just considering molecular geometry, we're at the top of a three-sided pyramid now, if you can see that, that's called trigonal or triangle, because they want to be fancy, trigonal. Pyramid or pyram pyramidal. Okay. If we have two lone pairs, make this the lone pair. It doesn't really matter. If this becomes a lone pair, these are just electrons. We have a bent molecule. So one lone pair, LP, it's from this family of sp3. And how would I know? Again, do your Lewis dot structures and count all the pairs of electrons or regions of electrons, and you'll get the hybridization. So two lone pairs, that's the bent shape, okay? And of course, because of its symmetry as a tetrahedral, all these being the same, this is a nonpolar molecule. Now, party people, something you should know, carbon and hydrogen have about the same electronegativity. So they share electrons down the middle. So there's never going to be a case where carbon-hydrogen bonds are ever polar. So that what that means is no matter what shape we have, generally speaking, this hydrocarbons are always nonpolar. Okay? And that's the skill. And let's try to apply that skill now to the second piece. All right, let's put dots on a piece of paper and see if we can answer some of uh, some of these things here. And let me try to move this over a little bit. Okay. So I have H2S. All right. Uh, I know hydrogen has one electron to fill its 1s1, so it's going to be terminal. So that tells me sulfur is in the middle. Now, I don't know what this is going to look like, so I start with an S, and I put the valence electrons. Okay. I know that it's 3s2, the, the outermost shell, 
uh, 3p4. It's underneath oxygen. So there's six valence electrons. So I'm going to put them out there. Okay. And so I go, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, six. I kept one out because I know that hydrogen is going to come by and donate one. This is hydrogen sulfide. All right. Rotten egg smell. Now, this works because sulfur now feels like it has eight. It fills its, what, P's up. It fills up the S and P. It's a stability zone. And um, sulfur feels like it has eight. Each hydrogen feels like. Now, how do I figure out hybridization? Well, my friend in chemistry, okay, what we do is count the areas of electrons. So I'm going to do that. And if I count the areas of electrons, I count one, two, three, four. Hello, that means an S and three P's came together. It's SP3. So I'm going to draw the orbital notation. And I know that there's a better way to show this, but these are four SP3s, and they're going to repel themselves into what we know as a tetrahedral shape. So this is the tetrahedral. Okay, and these are all sp3, and they have one valence. Well, let's see here. We have one here. Let's put the dots here. That was black, right? Um, so we have one dot for the s here, another one here, and then we have what? Two lone pairs. Hmm, lone pairs coming into play here. Okay, and so we have an h, which is 1s1. Get my sigma bond here, and each h brings an electron to the table, and that's what we have here. Remember, these are sp3s. We know the, the bond angle is 109.5. We'll talk about that in a second. But we know it's sp3 because we needed four pairs, four regions of electrons. It's a tetrahedral because sp3 always gives me the, te the tetrahedral shape. The molecular geometry is now different than the electron domain geometry because I'm going to consider where the atoms are. Here's sulfur. Here's the H. And two lone pairs okay, is that bent shape. And the molecular polarity, okay, is that this is a polar molecule. I'll say, what? Well, it's polar because it's asymmetry. It looks like it's symmetrical, but no. Okay, you have these two lone pairs bending this downward. In fact, a good way to look at this is here's my sulfur. Here's one lone pair. Here's another lone pair in the same plane. Here's one coming at you that makes the bond with the hydrogen. And here's one going away. If these are two lone pairs, they're both pushing downward on this guy to be bent. Okay? And that's what gives it its bent shape. In fact, this bond angle is going to be less, okay, than 109.5 by a little bit because these lone pairs, because they don't have a nucleus to attract them this way, actually are attracted more toward the sulfur when they're lone pairs. And they actually contract and push down on this bond even more. I guess I could write it this way too. Here's an S. Here's a bond with the H. Here's in the same plane with an H. Here's the lone pair coming at you. And here's the lone pair coming into the board, so to speak. And these two are bending down on the H's and it gives this this bent shape here. And if you think about it, you've got this S pushing down two H's. And that's not symmetrical, okay? Which means you're going to have a region of space that has more electron density, which, by the way, okay, would be right here. Sulfur is more electronegative, so it pulls in the electrons closer. And this would be electron region here rich, and this would be electron region poor. And so this ends are positive, it's negative. If this was linear, if there wasn't these two lone pairs, party people, this lone pair weren't here just like what? <gasps> if it was linear like what? S p it'd be linear and even though they're different it would be nonpolar but because it's bent see the bent nature helps describe the fact that this is going to be a polar molecule all right very important these two lone pairs bending down this one okay two parts of a tetrahedral all right moving on and we're going to move on to our first polyatomic ion nh4 plus 
Now the plus means that we're without an electron. So that when you do these dots, always, again, H is going to be terminal. So I know that I have an N. And I'm going to have four H's. I know N has five valence electrons. So I'll put them out there. Uh, one, two, three. Always thinking about the bonding. And then four and five. And if you think with me, if nitrogen has five and I'm plus one, not all the hydrogens can what? Give one a piece. This one gives one a piece. This one gives one a piece. And hydrogen gives one a piece. But this one doesn't. And that makes sense. If it did bring one more, okay, it wouldn't be positive. But it actually wouldn't work because what, what do you know about uh, uh, nitrogen? 1s1, 2s2, 2p what? 2p3 has five valence electrons, so it needs what? It needs three more electrons to fill its octet and have eight. So this hydrogen couldn't bring another one. So what happens is, so what actually happens here is it actually starts out as NH3 with that lone pair. And that lone pair gives a nitrogen compound's basicity. They have a lone pair to donate. And if you've got a proton, which we know is an H plus without an electron, it can actually bond with this pair without bringing any electrons to the table. We call that a coordinate covalent bond. And because it's bringing a proton to the table, okay, what happens is the entire chemical species becomes charged. And we put a bracket around it like we do ionic compounds. And this thing becomes plus one. Notice something. It's a polyatomic ion which has covalent bonding. So inside there's nonmetals and nonmetals sharing electrons, but in this case has one extra proton and the whole thing is charged. But just like I do before, okay, let's figure out um, let's figure out the regions of electrons. There's one, two, three, four. And guess what? If there's four regions of electrons, it's S and three P's came together. Automatically, we know it's tetrahedral, right? All the time. Now, is it bent from a molecular geometry? Well, no, because there is, there's, there's no free what? Lone pairs. So that's going to also be tetrahedral. Is it polar? Boy, it's not polar because it's charged. Anything that has a charge can't be polar. The entire area is charged. It's like asking number five, it's marital status. doesn't make any sense what... Um, if it's polar or not. If you ask the number five, it's marital status, it'll say that doesn't make any sense. So asking something that's an ion, if it's polar, makes no sense. So this is non-applicable. Anytime you have an ion, you can't be polar, okay, because the whole thing is positive one. There's no difference. It's not non-polar either. It doesn't make any sense. And to draw this, well, guess what? We've got our what? Four sp3 orbitals. Very simple when you think about it. One electron for each. This is a lone pair for the N. And then we have our hydrogen. And then our hydrogen, this one didn't bring any. This one brings one. This one brings one. And this one brings one. And the whole thing is charged, so we'll just put plus one. And of course, these are all sp3. Bond angles are 109.5, like they always are. So now we have a negative ion, and this is a little different. A negative ion, somehow an electron from the environment was absorbed into this chemical species to make it work. Now, given this polyatomic ion, just like ammonia is a polyatomic ion, this cluster of nonmetals, which, by the way, for the regions, or in other tables you may use in other chemistry classes, tables show this. So this is the um, thiocyanide ion. This is the ammonium ion. And they actually will react as ionic compounds. And I'll show that in a second. Any case, we have the sulfur. We have the carbon and the nitrogen. You may say, Mr. Grotsky, how do I know where do they go? I'm just going to write them linear. When you write, do a Lewis dot diagram, it is all trial and error Okay, in the beginning. And we're going to put all the valence electrons. Sulfur has six. So one. Two, three, four, five, and I'm going to put one here for the bond because it has to bond with the carbon. So I'm going to use one of the electrons, and I know that um, it's kind of it has six, and with the bond, it's going to need another one, and that may be where the electron comes from. Carbon, we know it has four, so we're going to put a bond here because it has to bond. Two, three, and four, and then nitrogen has the five. There's my lone pair. One, two, three, four. And I start with the bond. 
I was right, James Bond. I was just checking Bond. Sorry, <laughs> couldn't help myself. Any case, so um, uh, no more Sean. I was right. I don't understand this. Um, any case, um, the problem I have here is that that's the, that's the worst. I have an audience, so sorry. This is in a studio audience. This is recorded. Any case, um, the problem I have here is that Sulfur wants to share seven and wants to share, have have a total of eight. And so my friends, that's where the extra electron comes in. So I'm going to just put that there. And that's going to stabilize this sulfur, fill its orbitals. That's cool. And that works there. Now, this carbon is not at all stable. And if you don't see it, sometimes drawing a circle does and probably don't need to do that. But hey, I will do that for you. This carbon, by sharing, feels like it has, what, one, two, three, four, five, six. It needs two more. It needs two more bonds. Okay. Uh, and if you notice here, this nitrogen is sharing one, two, three, four, five, six. It needs two more bonds, right? So what we're going to do is create a triple bond over here. And if you don't see what I'm doing, you can move electrons around, the valence electrons, and see if you get these stable structures. So what I'm going to do is take this electron right here, say bye bye, okay? And then I'm going to move it here. I'm going to take this electron. That's why pencils do help. All right. And I'm going to move that right here. And then I move this electron to these positions here. And I'm going to create a chill bond. And that's the way I would increase my bond. So these two go bye-bye. All right. And there I go. And if I want to see this carbon now is sharing by sharing with the sulfur and the nitrogen feels like it has what? Eight, two, four, six, eight. So we can see right there, it feels like it's sharing. Eight. Nitrogen feels like it's sharing eight as well. And sulfur feels like it's sharing eight, but that's only when it what? Took an electron in from its environment. That's why it's negative one. And notice I kept it linear and it was just a guess. Okay, it may not work that way, but because it's there's no lone pairs of electrons above and below the carbon, I know this is linear. And if I know it's linear, I'm screaming from the top of the hills, this must be what hybridization. SP is always what? Linear. Why? Because it's bonding in one region on one side and bonding to another. Well, Mr. Grotsky, I'm seeing three bonds here. Yes, but what you do in a scenario like this, count regions of electrons. Here's the first region. Here's the second. I know there's multiple bonds here, but it's still the same region. So therefore, we have SP hybridization. Okay, and before I forget, as I probably will, we draw brackets around ions. So this bracket is negative one, and therefore it can't be polar or nonpolar. Again, if something is charged as an ion, asking if it's polar or nonpolar is like asking number five, its marital status. Doesn't make any sense. It's non-applicable. Can't be polar or nonpolar. It's an ion. So let's draw the what? SP orbitals that have to be linear because there's nothing bending it down. There's only two regions of space. So here is, okay, one sp and here's the other and i'm going to start over this part because I, I think i should be in the middle bad planning on my part so let's do that again so we're going to have a carbon in the middle here's an sp orbital there's only two and s and p came together and we'll put one valence electron in for each okay it has four Okay, now we have the sulfur over here. It's ending, it's terminal. I don't really need hybridization to explain it, so I'm not going to. Okay, and so therefore I have, an, I have a what? A P overlapping this. That could be PX, this could be PY, because I said so, and this is PZ. And I'll draw the circle unhybridized because the S is still there. And you remember, S had how many valence electrons? That's sulfur has six, two in the S, and then four more. One, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, and then this would be six, right? Which fills this orbital. Can't bond on this side. And we have one more open, and that's where the extra electron came from. To make this whole thing negative one, that's the extra electron. Now on the other side, we have a triple bond. This, of course, is a sigma. 
Now on the other side we have nitrogen and we don't need to explain it with hybridization so we will not. Some people will argue differently but hey I'm taller than they are. So I'm going to overlap an unhybridized P. That'd be P, X, P, Y, and P, Z. I'll draw the S being smaller so we can see what's happening in the P's. Bless you. Blessing anyone who might have sneezed out there just now. Just covering all tracks. Okay, so nitrogen has five. One. Kind of weird. Two. That lone pair doesn't appear unless you do hybridize it, but I'm just not. I'm going to show you. I can explain it without it. Okay, so one, two. All right. Um... Three, we'll do four and five. Now you notice something. We have our sigma bonds, which are the first two bonds here and here. That's what we did here. But we have two more bonds, and this is important. The first two overlapping bonds are sigma. The second and third bonds must be pi bonds. And pi bonds always come from a hybridized P. So where do the bonds come from? Well, wait a minute. We only have two valence electrons for carbon here. And this is important. This carbon is sp hybridized, but it has two more electrons. Well, that means there must be two unhybridized p's. If this is sp, there must be an unhybridized p going up this way, and another one p what z. So we have two unhybridized p's, and we're going to put the one electron here, and the other one here, and the double bond. And I'll do this with a different color. Let's go green. This is going to be one that goes in front and behind. That's one pi bond, so that would be maybe this one. And the other one goes, look at this, top, top I should say, and bottom. It's hard to, to see that, but we're using the unhybridized P's. Because it's SP, it opens a door for two unhybridized P's to do the what? To do the second and third bond. And that's important. Every time you see a second and third bond, the first overlaps. If the first overlaps, there's no physical way for electrons to overlap physically directly like a sigma bond again. So you have to do that perpendicular pi bonding. Again, this Z right here, PZ, is in the same plane of this PZ. This one's in front, and this one's in behind. Notice I drew one electron overlapping this one. There's two electrons now filling these two orbitals. These are weaker bonds. And then there's one on the bottom and on the top. All right. And of course, it's an ion. And of course, it's linear. It's 180 degrees. And I hope you had some fun with that. All right. Good luck.